Welcome back to the Better Call Saul Insider Podcast, episode 503. Uh, I'm Chris McCaleb. I'm one of the editors on the show and also of this episode. And this is episode 503, The Guy for This. It's written by Ann Cherkis. It's directed by Michael Morris. And we've got a, we got a gong of a podcast. We've got limited time. We've got to jump right into it. Uh, as always, with us is co-creator and showrunner Peter Gould. Hello. We're, we're sans Vince today. Vince, unfortunately, couldn't make it today. It's his first absence from the podcast. It's Breaking so? Bad. I think so, is yeah. That, oh, Since boy. Since Kelly started these. Kelly's also not here for this one. She's, it, it is a Saturday. Uh, she is at work on location in uh, an undisclosed location on assignment. And, uh, but, uh, but how are you doing, Peter? Uh, we're going to let loose. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, yeah. It is, it, we're podcasting after dark, even though it is, it is the morning. I will also say, Chris, I'm a little bit worried about you because I hear a little something in your throat. I'm and fighting. I also see a giant pile, <laughs> uh, a giant pile of uh, lozenges. I, I do uh, have some uh, some lozenges here. I'll take a picture of it. All right. Um, I don't know who wants to see. Everybody that picture, wants to see but... a picture of your lozenges. <laughs> but yeah, and we've got we've got some fantastic guests, uh, and I'll just I'll just go around the room first. We have the writer of this episode, Ann Cherkis. Hi. Welcome back to the podcast. Anne. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm sorry that we don't have a, a, a fine glass of scotch or whiskey for you to drink. As is the it's the Turkish signature. You know it is, and uh, but I don't drink it. So. I, well, more for us then. Yeah. And uh, we also have uh, the director of this episode, the fantastic Michael Morris. Hello, my hey. first time. That's right. Welcome to the yeah. podcast. Thank you very much. It's exciting. You did such an awesome job with this episode, and it was so fun to work with you. Everybody has been talking about it, and and uh, you also directed. Uh, spoiler alert: five oh six. Oh yeah, and uh, this, this just I this so much awesome stuff this season, and uh, we're, it was it was really fun to get to work with you, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love this episode, uh, and then finally we have our music supervisor Thomas Gullovich. Hello, hello. Yes, did I pronounce your name right? You did very nicely. The Thank most articulate God. man in show business. Oh my word. Um, how's it going? It's going great. It's going great. We, Thank you for joining. We have talked. Oh yeah. Well, I'll get to Joey. I'll get. <laughs> I did. I did uh, on a previous podcast. It did take about a half an hour to get to Joey because uh, uh, the introductions never stop. But on the wheels of steel, the ones and twos, the digits and the widgets. Joey Reinish. I think it's appropriate that my intro is when it started to peak and crackle. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, yeah. <laughs> shows I'm really doing my job over Guys, here. this is a labor of love. This is a this is something that we do on, on our in our free time and uh, we love doing it for you guys and we're glad that you, you listen. And in fact Chris is already working on another show. So yeah. he's he's coming in he's coming <laughs> in right. on the weekends. He's cutting he's cutting a pilot because he's He's in demand, and he should be, so thank you this very much for doing this, Chris. Well, absolutely. I just want to say, because I didn't really jump in when you were doing your um, introductions, because they were extremely professional, uh, but likewise, likewise, it's wonderful to get to direct something that is so beautifully conceived and so well written and so well acted, and then you, you, you gather everything that you feel like is telling the story and you want to communicate what you want it to communicate, and the experience of seeing your work, Chris, is mind-blowing. Wow. It's mind-blowing. It, it absolutely, it, there's just a shared language that somehow everyone in this community speaks, and it just allows for this thing to sing. So uh, thank you. Thank you. That's, that made my day. <laughs> well, this is it. That's it. Thanks for listening. Yeah. <laughs> we got, let's go out on a high note. Um, but uh, Thomas, uh, something that we've talked about on uh, future podcasts, uh, you may know we record these out of order, that you and your team, it, it, we, I know we say it every year and, and every year it, it, it never stops being true, surprising us with music in places that we think don't need it or it won't work with cues that on first listen, you think, well, that's the craziest idea. Where did you even find that? Where, where, where did that idea come from? And they work time and time again. It, it, it really is a testament to you and Yvette and Michelle and Garrett that this music just keeps working. And there's no uh, finer example for me than the teaser of this episode. Now, Michael has not seen the finished product yet, Ooh. but... Um, I mean, let's just dig into the teaser right away. There are two crazy things to talk about. One is the music, and two is just the nature of 
we're suddenly thrown into this microcosmos with ants. I mean, we should start with that because I think when all of us saw what Michael had shot, I mean, my first thought was, do we have a CGI budget that I'm not aware of? <laughs> <laughs> and then we found out that, you know, it was shot by him and not by like some special team, you know, off in Colorado in some lab somewhere. That was kind of shocking. And also the fluency and, and sort of the beautiful dance of your editing, how that was cut together mm. and the sound design of it. So in a way, it's a good example of a scene that did not need music. I mean, we could have easily had that sequence with just the sounds of the ants and the little final scream. And, you know, I think for us, at least with, with music, you know, we're really lucky we get a chance to come in at the end. So we already get a chance to see what Anne's ideas are in the script. And we're already thinking a little bit about what is this metaphor of this ice cream? You know, what is, and we thought, well, it's something that's delicious. It's, it's incredibly unhealthy. I have a really bad relationship with ice cream. Oh, likewise. And these Don't ants are, you know, essentially putting themselves in jeopardy from the temptation that's there. And the way, you know, Michael put the whole thing together, it's so much from the ant's perspective. So the metaphor now is not coming from above, but it's coming from below. And so when we were thinking about different ideas of how we could let music inform the sequence, one of the thoughts was, well, let's use the metaphor of Jimmy going into this world. He's really stepping into the world of the cartels. And he is, it's delicious because the money is tempting and his ego and everything else that he wants to f get fulfilled is, is part of this journey. But of course, we know this is not going to end well. Right. And so we thought, well, let's, so we tried a few things a little bit from above where we had some ideas. I think one of them was a Bing Crosby song. Uh, yeah, temptation, going Hollywood. And we thought, well, there's that sort of temptation of going to a place that's dangerous and you lose your soul in the process. And then we tried also some, uh, the first idea I think was uh, a, um, uh, a, a some gypsy music from Moldova. Uh, Anatole Stefanet was the first thing that I saw, which is sort of this very tense and dramatic piece of music. And I thought this could be really compelling and it kind of tells you about the danger he's going into. But where we, I think, ended up with and what you guys selected, which really was exciting, was the point of view of the ants, which is the ants are looking at this mountain of ice cream. And we thought, well, what does a little mountaineering ant want to hear? And that led to the crazy idea of like, well, what about yodeling? And what about like the Swiss yodeling music? <laughs> and we found this wonderful record from a, a, a group. They're a yodeling club in the, uh, the highest parts of the Alps in a small village. And they have been for, I think, 80 years turning in, you know, players in and out. And it was all men until the mid 80s. And then it turned into a men and women's yodeling club. And this song just kind of spoke to the sequence. And once we put it up against picture, we're like, all right, let's see what they think. <laughs> <laughs> and I also have to give some credit uh, to, to Larry Benjamin, our uh, dialogue and music mixer, because he put, uh, he just EQ'd that music and added a little bit of a, well, we call it slap in the, in, but it's, it's, it's actually a little echo. Uh, and for some reason that, that, just made it feel bigger, uh, even bigger than when we first put the music up. It's, and th I think the if there's a message to this podcast, it's that this is a team sport. Oh <laughs> and my then, god! And it's amazing. It's amazing. I have to. I'm, I'm just going to jump in because I have to ask Michael, how the hell did you do it? Because when we broke this, I remember Ann and I and the rest of the writers had this lunatic idea about these ants. Um, and the first thing I thought was, well, we're going to. Maybe we're going to have to hire, I hope it's not CG, but maybe it will be, there will be some CG. And I guess maybe we'll hire a company like Oxford Scientific, you know, which does amazing nature films for the BBC. And instead, you know, I kept hearing, well, they're, they're doing pretty well with this. And I sat down with, I saw what Chris had done. I was like, we don't need a frame. <laughs> there is not a frame. And there's not a frame of this sequence that was not shot by our, uh, actually our, was it our, was our first? Will you tell me yeah, the first yeah. unit? So uh, this is one of the, my favorite things I've ever been able to do ever to work on. So thank you for for writing this like insane opening. Uh, <laughs> we talked about a lot of different things, and actually one of the things we talked about earlier was CG is like a. Th it was it always felt like a safety net, you know. It always felt like well, if it doesn't work, you can have CG. And so we immediately, I remember in a scout van said, no CG, we don't want it, there's no safety net. Because you can't, you won't be able to shoot it if you feel like you don't really need to get it. So at that point, it was like, how are we gonna find ants to do this? How are we gonna get ants to do this? What's the right kind of ant to do this? 
um, we thought about going to the University of New Mexico and seeing if there were entomologists there who, who had some sort of expertise that turned out to not happen. Uh, we, we had hilarious roundtable meetings with uh, local um, animal wranglers who, who one after the other came in very confidently and said, yeah, no problem, we, we can do this. And then, uh, and then slightly sheepishly and sweetly sort of came in a couple of days later going, yeah, I don't really think we can do this. Uh, you know? <laughs> and then uh, we, we, we finally got the name of this like, quite grand but really nice guy, but the guy, like the ant wrangler who came in from Los Angeles. Again, like sort of riding on a, on a white horse. And we, we, I remember the phone call. This is my favorite part of it. English guy he is as well. And I said, oh, it's so great to talk to you. So what we need is, and I'd storyboarded the whole thing. And I want to give a shout out as well to the amazing assistant at, in your writer's room and everybody else who helped put together a sort of pre conceptual idea oh nicholas uh, nicholas yeah. our our actually our our uh, big shout out to our post pa nicholas post pa because we were me. just he, he, yeah. in the shit and and the 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 task came down we'll put together a bunch of like a proof of concept of yeah. nature footage and we just did not have the time because episode one was so big and uh nicholas is a very talented guy and uh he put that together and we, you know, gave him notes and he did an amazing job. He did a job. great job. He did a really, really good job. And, and, uh, and what, what he did for, you know, for those uh, listening is he, he, he compiled endless footage, found footage, uh, you know, from different nature documentaries of ants doing different things in different ways and compiling a sort of brief narrative sort of visual reference thing. And it was, it was really effective. Um, I storyboarded um, based actually, we share a lot of Tom, Tom, I was listening to you talk about your uh, inspirations for the music and, and, and Chris will remember we, we, we talked about very similar things actually and, and all my script notes are very similar. It's about the experience, how an experience turns, you know, from, oh, this is good. Let, let, let's get involved with this. Hey guys, this is pretty good. I may have been the first one to find this really good thing. Oh, look, everyone's coming. Whoa, you know, and, and how the thing devolves. And yet this, this one ant somehow manages to sort of surmount something even through the muck and the chaos and the, you know, the destruction. Anyway, so here I am describing that to the ant guy who was going to come and make all our ant dreams come true. And I said, so, so first of all, we want them walking in a line. I'm going to have the camera glide over this line of ants and they're walking. We don't know where they're walking yet. And we, so we just need ants like walking in a line. That's got to be easy, right? Because ants, we know, walk in lines. That's an, all we know about yeah, ants. That's all we know. Walk in lines. Know is they walk in lines. And he goes... Oh yeah, good luck getting that. <laughs> I was like, but how? But but you just ants go in a line. He goes, no, they don't. And I said, but don't you have a secret way of, of, of getting ants to walk in a line? And he goes, you try getting ants to walk in a line. <laughs> I was like, you're the <laughs> ant guy. <laughs> and then he actually, you know, him being the ant guy, he actually was brilliant. And he came with, you know, a whole bunch of ants, and uh, so many ants. Oh boy, imported and, from L.A. Yeah, imported from L.A. But you know, L.A. Um, ant. But amazingly. He took them all back as well. Like ants, you know, ants came and ants went home. We built the set. <laughs> um, it, we literally built a, a, a right. section of street. It's what this is tiny this, little... What is this set? Okay. I've actually asked to see a picture of this set. Yeah, I because I, I have one. I, I, no, I have really? Yeah, no, we haven't no, seen... Nobody has a picture of this. We really want... If, if we can get a picture Let of this, I want to... Some one of us needs to yeah. tweet out a picture of this set because I can't picture... What did this set look like? I'll describe it. And, and did uh, you have a little tiny, uh, little tiny clapper, uh, <laughs> clapper board? <laughs> there was a tiny slate. Yeah, there was yes. definitely a little tiny slate That's, for sure. So this, what's extraordinary? Okay, uh, I'll talk about this, and you can you can give me the sort of like universal symbol for shut up, which by the way <laughs> you can use at any point, um, or you can edit it out later. But um, w there's a couple of interesting things about about this. So we gradually got to a point where we knew we were going to shoot it. Uh, Marshall uh, and I started to look into what the right lens would be to capture something like this. Marshall is a genius of all things relating to any type of camera and I think had a lot of fun finding this very, very specific uh, snorkel type of lens that is this absolutely extreme macro lens where you can, where you can put the lens you know, m millimeters from the subject. Because I, m what I said to him is we need an ant to fill the frame. At one point, I want not, you know, a, an ant to be the star of this this picture, how, you know, and um, and not to sort of try and blow it up from a distance, but really, you know, get in there. And as I said, the camera gliding across them and over them, and 
Um, and he found this incredible snorkel lens, right? So we had this equipment. Um, the design team uh, quite brilliantly said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, they went and took reference pictures for exactly where it would be staged on the street with the ice cream cone and what would be in the background. And, and they built a, I want to say, six foot by six foot section of sidewalk, painted exactly to match the, the Albuquerque sidewalk. Um, so you had the curb going down and the little, you know, uh, concrete blocks the way that they would be and painted to, to match the exact tenor of the of, of the sidewalk and uh, but they put it on a table so that it was raised so that we could move the camera easily around and so ants couldn't fall off onto the floor it was all it had a little rim around around the side and they did a uh, an old-fashioned you would have loved it an old-fashioned like painted backdrop of downtown Albuquerque <laughs> which because they knew it would be so blurry in the background mm -hmm. you never know so it really looked like an Ed Wood movie is what it looked like. <laughs> uh, it, it, it was, uh, that's what <laughs> it reminded me of. But what was doubly kind of, what increased our degree of difficulty with this whole ant sequence is that we shot it not just on the same day, but at the same time, literally simultaneously as we shot the Hank scene in, oh. the, inter in the interrogation. What? Scene. Yeah, we ha shot those two scenes side by side. What? That was how that worked. So we, on so a different stage. Uh, yeah, so the video village yeah. was in between the two mm -hmm. stages, as it were. And if you look that way, there was the interrogation room set with that incredible scene yeah. happening. Which we will talk yeah. about. Yeah, we'll definitely talk we got about. to. Which was a definite sort of highlight. But then you, if you turned right and went that way past <laughs> the coffee, there was this incredible ant sequence. And so we had extra video monitors. And it was just bizarre because you'd have this experience where some of the finest actors of their generation were in a, a scene for the ages, meeting each other for the first time, and 15 people looking at an ant and pointing, going, oh my God, <laughs> did you see that? <laughs> because it was right above the other two screens, so you had an ants, and then you had the it's the only monitors. time that like yeah. Bob Odenkirk has been upstaged by an ant, um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so it, it was amazing and, and and massive props to to everybody who who worked on the sequence because it really it was very very technically challenging. Not least of which Paul, the camera operator, who who um, forewent the experience of of shooting the interrogation room scene so that he could really shoulder a lot of the lighting and a lot of the um, the, the camera work on, on the ant sequence, and pa it was amazing. Pa Paul Donaghy is uh, just a big shout out to him. He is, he is so important to the show, uh, our A camera operator. In fact, he, uh, he, he DP'd the, the next episode after this, episode, episode 504. Uh, he, he actually, he, oh, was, right. he was the DP because Marshall had to come back here to, uh, to do color for, for uh, El Camino, and Paul did a hell of a job. Uh, and we, we, we'll talk more about Paul, I'm sure. I would love to get him on the podcast. I mean, we've definitely, another, you've heard another, his name before. Another I wonderful voice, to too. He's, 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 a, he's a truly, I mean, you, you guys are so lucky on this show to mm -hmm. have the level of, of, of cross people that you do and, and, uh, and partners that you do. Everyone on the camera team, from the two operators through to the focus pullers, through to, you know, everybody, they, they, they do... Um, really really wonderful work speaking of focus just to just to, and I want to phrase this very carefully because one of the things that's remarkable about how we've come forward on the show is how perfect the focus work is on the show yeah um, but in this particular sequence and it, it's something uh, if you if you if you haven't sh shot with a camera you may not be aware of the smaller the object is the harder it is to keep in focus and there are, um, unusually for this show, there are focus buzzes, uh, what we call when something goes slightly out of focus for a moment uh, in this ant sequence. And I think that's one of the things that gives it credibility because yeah. if uh, you'd have to add those in if you were trying to do it digitally. Right. Uh, and it's, it is, it is, um, uh, it's, it's, it's the one time, it's the one scene in, in the season where we have a focus buzz uh, or there's a little, 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 fo it, it, for me, it, it works great. Chris, Chris and I talked about that. I right. remember that when, 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 when uh, we first sort of put that shot in, I remember us sort of actually having that conversation, um, funnily enough, and coming to a similar thing. And just to, just so, you know, from my perspective anyway, 
A fo focus buzz, yes, maybe. But remember, the things are millimeters right. high, and we were shooting at what 120 frames a second or something right. like that. So, it's slow. so the, the the slightest miss is going to show up in a way that you w would be imperceptible uh, normally. So, um, but yeah, I thought they. I mean, so these ants are in slow motion, also. Uh, sometimes, sometimes, so we've, not we've, always. We've sped them up. Uh, we did, there's a lot of of trickery that we used to to like put the whole thing together. Um, but yeah, and, and, and it, it's interesting that, you, that, that that I remember that you shot all that on the same day because the next day, which is when we get the footage, I, I got something like 12 or 15 hours of dailies or something like that, which is <laughs> seems physically impossible. Uh, but when you're shooting in slow motion and, and I, I want to say there are eight or nine hours of, of, of the ant footage. Which is, so it, this is a big credit to you because how do you sort through eight or nine hours of ant footage and, and even assemble that into something? Um, uh, that's what I think we, Tom and I were talking earlier. It, that's what's the mind-blowing part for, for a director is you, it's like, let's assemble this thing. And you come in and you're like, you, how did you assemble that? <laughs> that's insane. I mean, there is an, there is an honest-to-goodness ant movie star in, in, in oh, that yeah. sequence. Yeah, you felt, you definitely, we both did, that, fell in that, love with the guy. Uh, yeah. Was kinda, I, I or have, lady. I have know. to ask you, this is, this, is, this is for my own personal uh, uh, education here. You mentioned you storyboarded this scene. I'm fascinated because now that I've uh, worked uh, with you on three episodes, I'm fascinated to know a little bit about your process, about how you pre-visualize. Because one of the things that's striking about your episodes and your work is just the creative blocking uh, of the actors is something Chris, Chris and I and Joey talked about a lot while we were while we were uh, looking at this looking at this episode. Oh, absolutely! Uh, I, I'm really in, in. You have a theater background, I know, also, which which I think informs this. I'm really interested in when when you have a, a a scene, whether it's about ants or whether it's one of the amazing scenes that you have later in this episode. What's your approach? How do you figure out what you're going to shoot? How do you think about it before you actually get on the get on the set with the actors? Uh, it's, it's, it's a good question, and I think I can only answer personally because I'm sure everybody who directs does it differently. I think coming from, from a theater background is, is probably the most important part of it, which is in theater, um, you will spend a lot of time digesting, reading, talking about it, internalizing it in some way together, group internalizing, if you like, before you get up and do the blocking, and then you'll spend a lot of time blocking. And so none of that time exists in, in TV, unfortunately, but the essence of it can exist. So I, I don't think, I don't try and, uh, and have any ideas to block a scene until I feel like I have some kind of, I've internalized something about the scene. I, uh, and, uh, and that will change and can change but surprisingly often doesn't change because um, I've, try, I've tried and failed in the past to sort of think, oh, I, 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 these guys need to move around. Like, no one's moving enough, so why don't you get up and go over there? It never sticks. It never works. It just doesn't work. It's just not authentic. The, you know, it, people can move an awful lot in a scene, or they can move very little. Um, we do this every day of our lives. Sometimes we do completely random natural blocking. Somebody's leaning on a windowsill. Someone's leaning on a table. And through no reason or rhyme, they suddenly switch positions. Why? They're not talking about switching positions. It just happens. And you can find those, those moments with the actors, is, it, it, I think, is, uh, or at least not come uh, with a dogmatic approach. That, that, to me, sort of works. You find where the knuckles in the scene seem to live, and you go, well, you know, that might be a... It feels kind of like you, uh, you need something from him. So if, if, she, if he's going to go and, you know... Uh, if he's going to turn around and go to the kitchen, it feels like you're going to go after him, and you'd build it based on uh, based on that. Um, I, I understand I'm talking generally, but for me, I start to see it, it, it in my head. It really, really helps when the the script is clear about its intentions, and when the uh, w when the movements within the scene are apparent. Uh, so what that allows me to do is then I start to storyboard. But I, but I would I don't consider them storyboards unless it's a CG or action sequence of some sort. I don't come with storyboards. I storyboard them in my script so that that helps me um, figure out where my, 
where my cameras want what to do be. your storyboards look like are they little they're little movie frames yeah they are like the they're the sort of artistic equivalent of a doctor's prescription pad <laughs> you know you, you I wish you could see this right now uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna see whether I can uh, I don't well look here's a perfect if you have a if you have a script <laughs> pad, yeah a perfect example you know hello these now, are sketches. Now, yeah, they, they are. They are complete sketches. Hang on, I'm just looking through. What I'm doing is looking through notes um, on this script. They well, are pretty Michael, nice looking sketches Michael, for you, the listener if, at home. So, Michael, if you have, um, if there's any way that we could get uh, a, a JPEG of one of those, we'd love to put that up oh, to sure. go with the podcast. If you feel comfortable, because if you feel comfortable, yeah, sure. because and, and frankly, this is this is. I, I make it sound like it's for the audience. It's not for the audience. This is all for me. <laughs> this is all for me because I, I, for me as well. I am. I, I, I think a lot of us. Uh, I know Chris, Chris is a uh, Chris is, is a is a budding director, and I consider myself a a, a budding director. And I consider I'm, I'm always you an looking, excellent director. I'm always looking. I'm always looking looking uh, to you, to see. You budded already. <laughs> You know, I mean, case in point, that scene five, when Jimmy meets Lalo in that garage. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Oh, great that, scene, man. That mm, scene, you know, scene. I, I, beautifully scripted. Ugh. This this moment that, that uh, it, it's such a huge, because Lalo, out of nowhere, at the towards the end of last season, became this major character, and Tony Dalton is so fucking great. Oh, so I'm great. sorry about the language. Mom, I apologize. <laughs> I try and I fail to curb my mouth, but that scene, the, the footage, the coverage on that He's scene, and I talked with you about it, and I've yeah. probably talked Peter's ear off, and I think you could teach a class with that scene. It's so, the amount of dynamic coverage that you have combined with truly strong performances with all three of these actors i mean and nacho doesn't have a lot to say but he has a lot to do without speaking and then and you know and bob has uh jimmy has so much speaking because that's what that's what jimmy mcgill does or saul goodman And, and and i you know looking at it you shot all of this material, which is, it's roughly two and a half hours of footage. Um, and you shot from the time the first take rolled to the time the last take rolled was less than five hours. Wow. Now, which is crazy. Mm. Uh, but I, I understand that, that there was lighting and rehearsal. Like, how, how do you approach a scene like that? How much rehearsal are you able to do? And yeah, just talk about your process as far as... Um, that's, that scene specifically. That's so interesting to hear those details. You know, it, it's that makes a certain amount of sense when I hear it like that. But yeah, um, there, th- we were efficient partly because we had to be because light. You know, light in the day. You know, we had already shot a lot that day, and that was the that was the last thing that we were doing. Um, and it's funny, just but I will. I'll try my best to answer your question. Um, but I just want to say that for a scene that is so much about talking, there's a, as you say, there's an awful, there's a lot that Lalo says, and then there's a lot that that Jimmy. It really is also about silence, mm-hmm. um, and this was a, an episode which had a lot to say about not saying anything. Absolutely, which, which is one of my my favorite things about it. When from the moment I read it, and this one particularly, it's just come from a scene with no dialogue, which has itself come from a scene with no dialogue. <laughs> Um, and you've gotten to the, you've finally gotten to this place. And I think because we are Jimmy in that moment and we are, we are with Jimmy, we don't know what this is. We don't know how to play it. We don't know what the play is yet. And so it's tense. And even through some of the first part of the dialogue, um, when we have, uh, Lalo going over to the mirror and the sink, a large part of that was to keep that mystery if you like to keep to keep it unclear what the right play is don't mm-hmm. give jimmy all the information he's so good at reading sometimes but he's re- he's he's really good at getting a read on a room that's his superpower uh make him make him suffer before he has to just play this one way and commit um these scenes funny enough yeah there's an awful lot going on in the scenes we're very, very lucky with these three actors. Um, I, I don't want to be a broken record here. At some point, I promise, maybe I won't say how lucky we are with, with, with um, these elements. But with these three specific actors, Tony also does a lot of theater, actually. So these kind of extended scenes uh, are right in his wheelhouse. 
Uh, Michael, there's no one who, who conveys um, intensity and concentration like Michael Mando. So um, we knew that he was bringing a lot of that atmosphere into the room. Right. And, and I remember this reminded me a little bit of the, 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 one of the early scenes that Anne wrote that we did together with the bikers at the, mm. uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, in season four. At season the doghouse. Season four. Yeah, the doghouse. Um, where Bob is so good at the, these moments of sizing up a very dangerous situation. What is my opposition? How big is it? Can I take it? How am I going to take it? Um, and then just committing to that moment. So I remember at one point, uh, probably towards the end of shooting the scene, and uh, you know, when you get really good performances, Sidney Lumet used to talk about this, when you, when you get a really good performance, why go again? You know? But you do, like partly for me, it's the theater, I think, in me, which is like you don't just do it once and then, and then say goodbye. You do it because the next time you do it, you may get something different. Now, not, not everyone agrees with that. Some actors are like, why are we going again? You know, I thought we got it. Um, but I remember it, it was a very grueling scene. There was a lot, of, uh, a lot of stuff to memorize and a lot of, you know, they, they had to be in the right spots for the cameras to pick them up and all this stuff. And I remember going to Bob. And sounding him out like, uh, you know, I, feel, I really think we're getting great stuff. It's not that. I feel like we, he goes, can we go again? And I said, yeah. He says, great. I love this. Like that. And that, well, that really was the energy in the room was, I love this. I don't want this scene to ever end. You know, um, so I, I think the answer is, well, how do we get so much good footage? Yes, I think I put the camera. And I, I, could, I have a diagram, funnily enough, of that scene. And I think it's pretty much, ex I genuinely think this is one where it was pretty much exactly as it, as it played out. Well, the audience can't see it, but no, yeah. you're, you're so clearly invested. There's like an emotional connection between your sketches and the script, yeah. which is kind of what describes, I think, for all of us, the process that we have. We kind of fall in love with like the words on the page first, and then with the yes. rough imagery, and then the choices that the actors are making. And each one of those things gets us so emotionally attached that we try to figure out how can we play too. Yeah. And that's the neat part. It's like it's a great choreographed dance between a whole bunch of people it that really all have to figure out, am I dipping or am I being dipped? And starting, you know, with, with Peter, because, you know, it, 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 every conversation at the beginning, you're, you're telling the story. There's no greater joy for those, for those of you at home. There's almost no greater joy than having... Peter tell you the story of <laughs> <laughs> it's well, wonderful well this is this is all based on what Anne has written of course but it really okay, is okay but it also starts with the whole room <laughs> that's right that's what, you know that's and that's the the fun of it and it's the fun I mean it's interesting you say that's fun because our show you know we're Michael's really talking about our um, tone meetings which is mm. where is our one chance to kind of let the director in on all the thinking behind the script. Mm -hmm. And um, we're known for having immensely long tone meetings. I will say that when I started this, uh, because I had been working with Vince for so long, I thought, well, sure, when I do tone meetings by myself, it's going to go fast because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I don't have as much to say. And, and the truth That's is, for true. whatever reason, for whatever reason, the tone meetings go just as long, <laughs> just as, <laughs> just as long. Uh, so Michael has a, uh, in addition to everything else, he's got stamina. Uh, <laughs> and it's a big part of what, it's a testament to the, the quality of the show is because you, when you set the tone in those tone meetings and you answer all these questions and everybody gets on the same page, that's such a, I mean, have, you know, working on other things sometimes, people just aren't on the same page yeah. because they don't have the clarity that mm -hmm. comes out of these tone meetings. I, they, they're long, but they're very beneficial. That's, yeah. I think that's true. And I think it's also, we try to be as specific in the mm -hmm. script. And yes. You get the tone. Yeah. Right. Yes. I mean, that was one of the things that I loved when I first started working on the show. When I, I remember when I started writing I, my first episode, which was 205, um, how, because, you know, there are a lot of, everyone says something different about how much you should put on the page or not put on the page. And, you know, everyone has their own take on it. But I always loved having, making sure that the reader understood what was going on and, I loved that Peter and Vince also, you know, worked that way and that I could get so specific in the, not, I mean, of course, dialogue, but actually more so in the description. I, I hope that you'll publish one day 
a book of the, honestly a book of the scripts i don't know if it's if people do that i don't know if it's done uh, but a, maybe. publish a book of these scripts because and i i, I mean to cut you off yeah, just yeah, to reinforce sure. uh-huh. you put your finger on something really really important for a director and i think they're in the same way for almost anyone who likes the show which is the dialogue conveys what they're going to say and the tone of what they're going to say uh, but the show has a personality the show has a character you capture the character of the show in the descriptions yes and that yes. is huge and for I, us. yes and i you know that's one of i mean i will take away a lot of things from having worked on this show but that is a huge one for me and it has changed i mean i've certainly become a better writer since since working on the show but you know writing other things I've been, you know, things I've been doing outside of the show, it's, it has made me a better writer. And it, because even though, yes, you, of course, writing for, it's a blueprint for something that gets shot. But before that, you have people read it. And the people, hopefully people who are going to make the movie or the, the, the episode, and you, they need to understand what, not, not, they need to understand the story, but they need to understand, I feel like, these very specific moments within a scene that, you know, combined make up the, the, the story and make up the feeling, the tone of what you're trying to convey, which is, it's, that's beyond the words, you know, and I think I've, I've learned to do this. I mean, you know, getting notes from Peter and getting notes from Vince uh, is just been, it's been such an amazing learning experience because, I mean, I, I can take that with me now and I feel like it involves, it, it, it brings the reader into the world, your world, and your your frame of mind, and what you were thinking when you were writing it, all of that stuff, and I think it, it makes a big difference, and the last thing I'll say is that I agree, Peter, it is all about specificity. Mm. It is mm. all about specificity. If I, you know, am ever talking to a newer writer or something, it's one of the most important things, um, because yeah, I mean, screenwriting, writing for television is is all about is all about creating an image in in the mind of the reader, you know, at, at initially. But I would say even mm-hmm. tied to that, sorry to cut you off. I feel like one of the things that's really amazing about the scripts, and and Michael, you might be noticing this as well. There is specificity, but there's also space. Mm -hmm. So it means that Mm -hmm. you not only have a very clear idea about what is the the dynamic of a particular scene, what are the motivations Mm -hmm. of the characters, also what are the power relationships, Mm -hmm. and they can be very simple Mm -hmm. and very specific ideas, but then we still have air to kind of contribute. And I think that's the part which is so key, and I think this is what... Peter and Vince do so well is create this atmosphere where everyone is given permission to be creative and to find ways of contributing and all the hallmarks are there. So the choices the actors are making are reinforcing ideas that came to me maybe in the script but weren't fully clear. And then the, you know, the blocking from the directors is saying mm-hmm. like, oh, this scene is actually about something else. And mm-hmm. if we focus on that part, we're getting to the truth of it as opposed to the more superficial components of sort of a standard narrative to a show. And I think what makes it so special and why this show is so exemplary in in each department is because of that space Mm. that creative direction Mm -hmm. the specificity but the space to fill it in with the ideas that are percolating inside wow Mm -hmm. well Mm -hmm. i will just say i think i think the liberating thing about and you know screenwriting classes i'll tell you don't write the script don't direct on paper yes which i think is but i think you want to get the point across and part of the liberating thing is to not put everything in dialogue and the more right. in, the most interesting scenes are the scenes where there's there's uh there's subtext or stuff going on underneath the dialogue right and it helps it's in, it's interesting this is so cinematic because it plays when plays are published at least the published plays i've read it is all dialogue and then a little bit of blocking uh so but but in in in, in our world we're trying to help everybody on the set understand what the hell we're trying to do <laughs> and if it's and it's just not it's in the ideal world it's not in the dialogue and of course this I, I have to say this is a great discussion I I'm itching for us to talk yes. about the big yeah uh, the big the big thing in this episode hell that's, yeah you know I mean so meaningful to it, everybody who's watched Breaking Bad 
that finally yes. we're yet to see the return of Hank Schrader and Steve Gomez. How did this happen? Well, I mean, it obviously, like anything, it starts in the it started in the room, and we were. I think what happened is that we we got to a point where there was just a moment that I think it was it must it was Peter I think who who said well you know we have these characters we need we need some sort of you know we need some sort of agent uh, agents to come in and uh, to the scene and then Peter had the brilliant idea of, well why is why let's make it Hank. And, uh, you know, let's make it Hank and Gomi. And it was just, it was sort of this perfect, it was a perfect idea. And, you know, so we, 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 con- we conceived it with them. I think we were worried for a long time that we might not be able to actually get the actors. And so that sure, was, yeah, that's so be we, we sort of, yes. And so we, we went along under the, you know, we, we proceeded under the assumption that we would, but I think it was, you know, it was a little scary. It's, we're always walking the plank. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'll say there's another aspect to it, and I don't even think I shared this with Anne or anybody else at the time. Hank is a character who was created by Vince Gilligan. He's only ever appeared in Breaking Bad, which was, I, I worked on it, I'm very proud I worked on it, but that was Vince's show, and he ran it. And as, as you know, it's no secret, Vince stepped away from the show to a great extent this season. He did direct an episode, which of which more later. Uh, but I, I, it gave me a, it, it, I, I was a little jumpy about uh, writing this character uh, and giving him dialogue and without Vince knowing Vince was there as a backstop, and so I made a special effort. And Vince, you know, it's 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 all depends on the season and and everything else. How quickly Vince reads the scripts, but uh, I made I made a special point of taking Anne's scenes and making sure that Vince had read them uh, early in case we had to pull them apart. Uh, and he was he was he had other notes on the scripts, but he did not. He really didn't. <laughs> I don't think he really gave very many notes or any on on the stuff that I was worried about, and, and did such a great job of bringing these bringing these guys back to life. Well, with uh, with your help, yeah. I mean, I didn't work on Breaking Bad. I was a fan, and so I was just sort of going off of what I knew from what I had seen. It's it's just it's it's interesting because they for me as a writer, the thing that I find most intimidating to write or to work on is banter that doesn't. Go to where there's not uh, there's not a a, a, a specific forward moving intention, and those are always the scenes that it just it, it's it's the uh, the royale with cheese scenes uh, <laughs> that that are that are very important and mean mean a lot. I find those scenes those are the ones that that I, that I get edgy about because it's finding the right thing and the right way to express it. And Anne did such a wonderful job, and and uh, you know of course it was all discussed in the room but you know Anne is um gifted with with in so many ways uh just close your ears Anne I don't want you to get a big yeah well. but 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 she has she has a way of capturing uh the way these characters speak and of course then there was the moment while Anne was writing when and I roped Vince into this conversation <laughs> uh because we wanted to call uh, we want we needed to call Dean right and Dean you know Dean has no reason to want to revisit this character necessarily he's done a lot of great work since Breaking Bad he is a brilliant actor uh, you could and I could have easily said, heard Dean say you know what guys I think we did this character I think we gave him an end I oh, don't really want to oh, revisit I don't really want to revisit him uh, and uh, he didn't instead we and, I think Vince and I both had a little bit of, uh, you know, it was a little sweaty. Uh, so we pitched him, you know, this is this is this is Hank before everything got so dark on Breaking Bad. This is the happy, happy Hank. The Hank we met. The Hank originally. we met. Yeah. And I think Dean, I, I don't want to speak for him, but I think that's he likes that. He loves. He is a person who he just he has such a way with comedy and reacting, and I think he has those chops. Uh, and so he was I, I was, I was relieved because I, we would have rewritten the sequence and we would have introduced new characters uh, and we probably would have taken, not made them DEA, frankly. Mm-hmm. We would have made them just cops. 
And but I think, man, it, it just it's it's I feel like we earned something wonderful here. And I just want to mention one other thing, because before the before we started on the podcast, uh, we just and because these things are all recorded at weird times. We just had uh, our, our uh, television critics panel and, and oh, we right. announced a couple things. Uh, and one of the things that came up in the panel was the fact that Dean is in these first in these two episodes. And that was my my choice to release that information for better or for worse, uh, and I the, my logic was multifaceted. I think a few years ago we probably would have kept it under wraps, but first of all we want to we're proud of it. We think it's great. And by I by the way this whole show is premised on the idea that how things happen is more interesting mm-hmm. than what happens. <laughs> mm-hmm. If that makes sense, I probably sure. said that before. So I, I didn't think it would ruin it for folks because the scenes are so great. But then the other thing is we always get the question every year, uh, are <laughs> there going to be people from Breaking Bad visiting? And right. we've been traditionally cagey. And we usually what we say is, you may see some familiar faces, but you're not going to see Walt and Jesse because uh, we don't. we want to be... Um, upfront about that we don't want to raise expectations that we're not going to fulfill and i just felt like we would have said oh yeah you're going to see some familiar faces and then you but we're not going to see walt and jesse and it just kind of narrows things down and instead of playing a big game of cat and mouse i thought we would just we would just just say it and then the final thing was he's and i you know Hopefully it's not a spoiler for anyone listening to this. He's only in two episodes this season. And I didn't want people to feel like, wow, we've given him this great introduction. Now he's a series regular. And so they tune in later in the season. All right, this is great. I love everything I'm seeing. Where's Hank? Where's Gomi? Uh, And so, you know, it's it's a tricky tricky thing. You know, the whole question of spoilers, uh, I I think we could do a whole podcast just to talk about not what spoilers are from a uh, the point of view of the audience, but what a problem we have as creators trying to decide what little glimpses to give folks uh, to get them to watch because we want people to watch and what things are going to ruin surprises. And it is not it is not straightforward at no, all. You guys, being... you, you guys used um, uh, fake names in the script. That's true, we did. You know, at no point did you say Hank or Gomez in any of the scripts, as far as they, I know. What were their names? What were they named they in the were script? Duke and Yancey. Duke, Duke and Yancey. <laughs> 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 no, I mean, I was just, it's about the spoiler situation, which is, again, it's a podcast of its own. But there is sort of this emotional manipulation of the audience with spoilers and the anticipation of it. And because we're a prequel, in a weird way, we're structured almost with the idea that we're slowly unveiling, you know, the history and when do we get caught up to it. And in a way, it can be very distracting from the story that's mm. at hand mm. and make the audience kind of more anticipatory as opposed to being immersive. And it seems like it's a tricky balancing act. So when I first saw the the photo of Hank, I was like, oh my God, why are we giving this away? And now that you're describing it in a weird way, it's the most honest and integrity worthy way of doing it, of saying, Yes, he's coming back. You're going to look forward to it. How it shows up now is going to be the experience. And I think that's the part. Like how you, Michael, had introduced him. I love that sort of blurry <laughs> shot of him just walking past. And it's like, it's a belly and a shirt, but it's a shirt color choice. Yeah. So yeah. J- props to Jen on that. It's, it's how he's walking. It's the way you chose the focal point of it. Like, it's a fantastic way of introducing it. And I think also the sound team did a great job of not giving it completely away. The audience is leaning in to figure out, it's like that great Rosemary's Baby shot with like, you know, when you're trying to go around the corner to see the conversation that's happening, you know? <laughs> you lean in on it. And that's such a nice part of the way we undo our storytelling. What was it like working with, um, now I was very disappointed because I wasn't able to be, I had every intention of being in Albuquerque for these scenes, uh, but it turned out we we needed ten episodes, not just three. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't I wasn't there, and this is also interesting for both you, Michael and Ann, because you're both new to our world. You're not breaking. There were Breaking Bad folks there. I mean, especially oh, yeah. Melissa Bernstein, who is at the core of both of these shows, and is 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 probably the unsung hero of the Gilliverse. Uh, but but the, you guys, you this was this was new for both of you guys. How was how is it working with uh, with with Dean? It was fantastic. I mean, there was I was listening to you say uh, earlier about these little ripples of anxiety that you felt in writing dialogue for a character that that, that existed in a 
in a slightly parallel universe to this one, you know, um, and that you hadn't taken responsibility for, full responsibility for before. Mm -hmm. And that was really interesting to me because um, how many pages w w was the scene? It was maybe like a five, six, was it more? It was more, was it I Maybe think. an eight-page scene something or something? Something like that, so, yes. Um, the number of times that, that Dean stopped and said, this doesn't, it's not sounding quite right. I, can, I, can I say it this way instead? In my experience, he would say this, is zero. Never once did any of the actors who were playing now, I don't know if it's for the first time, but it felt like the first time, who are now fully and semi-officially playing roles that they have played before mm -hmm. with each other, um, all at the same time, not fragmented, but in a really, really sort of, uh, we really could sit in this scene give it plenty of time to feel false if, it, if that was how it was going to feel. Never, never did. Never, ever did. Um, and, you know, we shot that scene from many angles. We shot it from, um, we, like with many, as with many scenes that are essentially sitting across a table. Um, I'm not afraid of shooting things sitting across a table, but um, there was such electricity in the scene. This is, I think, uh, a, Thomas may have said this before. Someone certainly said this before on this podcast. It is written. It crackles. Maybe Peter said this. It crackles with electricity. Oh yeah. When you read it. So, uh, and that's by the way a very important job of a director uh, is is to is to be a good reader. Um, you, it's important to it's important never to read these things half-heartedly. Uh, you only have one chance of your first read of these things, and respect that chance. Whatever that means to you, if it means putting headphones on and listening to classical music, do that. If you want to listen to Megadeth or punk music, do that. <laughs> no music, do whatever puts you in a, in a position to really, really read it before you start to take it apart, before you start to try to make decisions, before you start to see a shot. Don't see a shot. Read the script, and it'll give you a feeling. It will always give you a feeling, and sometimes the feeling is clearer and there's less static involved, and you can really kind of get a very strong feeling from the script and sometimes you have to really work this is an example of it just crackles it just sparks off the page when you read it and so um, then my job becomes how does the camera help capture that because I know what it is now because it just it literally announces it announced itself to me when I read it um, okay they're sit they're largely sitting around a table how do you how are we going to run into a problem with just it being boring, quite frankly? It's a small gray room, you know, with, with limited windows, all the things that you kind of rely on to make a scene visually exciting. Uh, uh, so what do we do, uh, which isn't going to feel tricky, which isn't going to feel like we're just... Because this show, uh, and Breaking Bad, this show, I think particularly, is, I think, peerless at using creative camera angles to to make unexpected moments happen, but it, it, they're always earned. They are never done. Like I did a, I, I did a shot that I knew I was going to do um, in the first Hank sequence, just from inside the gun safe, you know, mm -hmm. put the gun. That was such a great but, idea. But I th love th that That shot. made sense to me. Like, you know, I love this show, and I love the, 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 the rich tradition that you guys have established in this universe of being able to, to put the camera in unexpected places. It's fantastic. But this wasn't one of those scenes. There isn't a there isn't wasn't a cute place to put the camera. There, you know, uh, I, I didn't want to make a, a a shot that felt unearned. So, so yes, we did. We what I decided was that it was essentially about um, there was a performance aspect to it, uh, and it, it was very helpful in the scene that he got to he got to uh, take Domingo down and 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 do that little performance for Hanky Gomez. Uh, there's the there's the other physical moment when they get up to leave and stop, um, and but beyond then I think it was just a, this is a perfect example to answer your earlier question about um, about learning what it is that the actors are giving you how big it is that they're going to give you, so Jimmy's a very physical character Bob is a wonderfully physical actor if it's possible to get him up, get him up go a little bit wider because uh, and Peter said this before many times to me director to director. You can go wider because he's going to act with his, his whole body. And what's a perfect counterpoint to that is Dean, Dean's eyes. Like, Dean just reacts in the smallest ways, and they're phenomenal. They tell, they tell the entire story. 
So um, I would love to wrap this up in a beautiful bow, but it really isn't. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, except that scene was, was a perfect example of, of imperfect tools that you would otherwise look for in a you know, director's shopping list. Like you'd want glorious Panavision vistas and a, you know, and a giant crane. And, you know, <laughs> and here we are in a you know, six foot by six foot room. And it didn't, none of it mattered because you know, these, these actors jumping back into it as seamlessly as the dialogue rolled off of them, uh, they created, I think, that, that atmosphere that I, uh, that I found on the page. Yeah, I mean, I, and just like you, and, and just Michael and Peter, I mean, I was anxious too, because I was like, I want this, you know, I want people to be excited that we're sitting here with Hank and Gomi, and we have this wonderful, we have this wonderful uh, dialogue between, between Jimmy and, and, I mean, we were so excited about it in the room, just when yes. we were talking about it and so there I am and you know it's happening and uh, I will say that can add pressure too when you're in the room when, yeah. when us when we're all in the room and you get really excited about something right right you kind of and you're on this I just know this from being uh, on set as a writer you just oh, boy, I hope I'm delivering yes. we're delivering right. all that thing that we were so we're, excited about <laughs> exactly, back in the room exactly and we worked so hard to get this actor here and you know but I have to say I mean just from my perspective not, you know as as the writer and just being being there with with Dean um, and watching him as a fan because mm -hmm. I loved that character on, on Breaking Bad. And he was everything I would have hoped for and more. I mean, he was, not only was he just, you know, a very professional guy, but he is such a fine actor. I mean, he would give, you know, take after take, he would, he would give us just wonderful, wonderful moments. And, I mean, I would sit there and I was cracking up because he just was so much fun to watch. And he just, it, you could tell he was having fun, and it was such a relief. Yeah. It was also what I'd like, it reminds me a little bit of the scene in Breaking Bad when Hank is in the toilet and he realizes yes. from the book. Which <laughs> is, and Michael, your point earlier was about how so much from Dean is these little moments of thoughtfulness behind the eyes, and that the vulnerability of the character is constantly right there on the edge. For, for a guy who presents himself as being this wall of, of power and authority, he is somebody who's perpetually one step away from absolute cataclysm. And in the scenes there, which the stakes are completely different, obviously, you know, he's just trying to figure out how to shake this guy down and get what he needs. But so much of what's being expressed is in those shots and the framing of them and the choices of how close you are with him versus Bob is really telling you so much about the story of both the actors and the resources you have available to the storytelling, but also of their particular power relationship in that moment so for anybody who's watching it whether you're picking up on all these things or whether you're just feeling them they just have such integrity to them and that's what carries you further down that story so effectively and if you ever ask yourself like well what does a music supervisor do they just like pick music I think what you're hearing from Thomas is no a great music supervisor is thinking about every detail of the story, how the characters behave, how the characters interact with each other, and finding the music through the story. I, the, just what you're saying, your, comp, your level of comprehension, it is a real testament to what you bring to everything that you work on. Well, Having you. worked with funny. you on a bunch of things, and it, 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 never, it never fails to excite me when you talk about the story and about the way that you perceive things it, it, it is I I, I I know I'm not alone in that too. absolutely that's very kind of, I mean I think ultimately it's the same thing that for anybody who's on the project like I, I remember when I was working on Six Feet Under a long time ago they were very kind and they let me look at dailies and I watched Francis Conroy's choices in each of the scenes and in studying having read the script and seeing the choices that she would make I realized that she was a very generous actor because she was giving her other actors opportunities to respond to things. And in watching that, I realized that what she's doing is having at least five very specific ideas in her own mind. How much she articulates it, I don't know. But presenting those ideas to the actors, to the editors, to everybody else to see what works best. And in a way, that's our job too. Like our job is to say, I have five really strong ideas of what this could be about or how I can possibly help out. I want them all to be different and I want them all to be valid. Um, and uh, the right answer will come to me because of the chemistry and the genius, obviously, of the people building it, knowing here's what I really want this to be. And then hopefully one of those moments will really do it. And you guys are really good at saying, we don't have it yet. And I think that for us, as 
terrifying as it is to say, oh my God, I'm in love with all these ideas. There's a great joy of saying there's another solution. Let yeah. me go keep digging. I, I, I've got to say also, this is the context today is very interesting because yesterday, literally yesterday, I was watching a scene uh, that I directed that I thought was pretty damn good. Uh, and we kept on, we listened, I think you had sent like five or six different things, and I started despairing because I, there has to be music here, but how can this work? How is this going to work? What, and then I think it was, they're all, they're all lettered. So I don't know if it's K or J, God knows, <laughs> God knows, way down. They're suddenly at the very, the very last one, snap. And it's like you can watch it and suddenly you can see a scene just, snap and wow and sometimes there's a scene where there's choices and you go well that works or that works and which one do I like better and then sometimes it just snaps into focus and it makes and I, I felt that the that with uh in this episode the yodeling uh was that because uh it just it made me feel I it's interesting we had a lot of opinions about the ant scene here where people would watch it and were disgusted or revolted or, or just found it kind of uh, scary. Dis- scary. I find it, yeah. And I always kind of was rooting for that ant. That that ant, because of the way you guys, uh, Michael and all all you guys, and the way actually it was the way Ann wrote the scene too. That I felt that this ant was I, I, I was kind of on team ant. Oh, um, likewise, <laughs> yeah. team ant. It's very triumphant. And the uh, and the the yodeling. <laughs> Uh, made me feel that there was a heroism in this microcosm. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, at the very end of the scene, the one ant makes it to the tippy top of, of Mount Ice Cream Cone. And he's, and there's, there's, there's some, some of the ants are yelling. Uh, and it's, um, it, it, it's, it's just, it made me, you know, it's being king, feeling like the king, but, you know, you're, on top of an ice cream cone, it, uh, it's, it was just, it's something fast. I felt like you really the, the that yodeling sort of nailed nailed it, and it's and it's it, you can hear how Thomas it, so much more articulate than I am, because I, I'm I always feel like I'm groping when we're talking about this stuff, and I, I always feel like I'm just it's it's I'm, I, my eyes are closed and I'm groping in the dark trying to find mm. it, and Thomas has this. Uh, this incisive way of uh, of getting to it, and it, but he has to do that because music is so ephemeral and has so many associations mm-hmm. that it's almost you have to be that clear in order to. Otherwise, you just start. And when I was a film teacher, I was no big secret. I used to teach at USC. One of the things I learned at USC from having watched hundreds of student films is that any piece of music will work on any imagery. You can you can do it at random and it will always work. Uh, it's it's oh people are always surprised by that. But the truth is, you know when you when you hear about people playing the dark side of the moon and with the Wizard of Oz backwards, <laughs> it's no surprise to me at all. Maybe it's because humans have a certain rhythm. But the trick is, it won't make the meaning that you intend. It'll make a meaning. But what is the right meaning? And that is uh, that is that is uh, that's that's our exploration when we're when we're mm-hmm. in post on on these episodes and choosing the perspective too. Yes. I think what's really nice about the perspective that you described is that Jimmy's not going into this world of the cartels thinking he's in trouble or he's doing something wrong. He's thinking I can beat this. Like I I have the skills to make this work for me. And that's what that ant has. That ant has that sense that like yeah this is dangerous. This is like sticky. My buddies are all getting lost in it, but somehow I'm the one that can make it to the top. And I think you know I, that's interesting. I, that might be that might be more about the series or the season than it is about this episode. Because I think in this episode. Um, not to give anything away, I think Jimmy's um, ethics are still alive, and that's one of the things that I I'm so admire about Bob's performance mm. and the way Ann wrote this and and the way Michael brought it to life uh, is that Jimmy he has not jettisoned his, his his sense of right and wrong yet. If he ever does, we'll find out. Um, and I, no, I, I, I'm I know sorry. we're no, 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 no. We we're almost out of mention, time, but we I have to mention Barry Corbin. I, I, well, that's yeah, I know yeah. we're, we're going to run out of time, but I, 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 we can't not talk about it because you know we, we've talked about largely two scenes where things went very, very well, <laughs> where you, you had a plan and and executed flawlessly from my perspective, and then you have this this fantastic scene where 
Kim goes to see this new guy, Mr. Acker, and it's this brand new location, this remote place, and it, I, I think it, it, it proved to be a, a very difficult scene from a production standpoint and from a, from a post-production standpoint. And, and uh, it, uh, talk a little bit, a little bit about, I mean, there, there were storms, there yeah. were sandstorms I've, I've understood. Yeah. I mean, location. so, so yeah, there, there's a little bit of a, I mean, headline, well, spoiler alert, the production problems w were not related to Ray Seahorn or Barry, Barry Corbin. No. Like, you know, Thank God for those two. No, this was like honest to goodness. Like here we are in the middle of a desert in uh, in New Mexico, and and huge shout out to uh, Christian uh, locations manager because there were some very very specific requirements to find a location like this, and somehow uh, we found this location that could stand in for 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 this um, place that had been created in the script, where this one lone house was was holding out right against the bank. Um, so the great news about that was during the day we got there and we were we were up on a drone at one point we were up on a crane at another point we were really like trying to tell the story of this 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 the planes and and this one house more good news the house looked great designed fantastically um more good news barry corbin amazing news uh more good news it was a great scene for for ray what fabulous scene she had to walk in and she had to uh to to play this scene which had a big turn for her in the middle I was hoping that she would be here for this. But, she uh, is here for this. She's right there. Racy, racy. Spoiler alert. Just, she, she just walked. Podcast. She walked in the office. But then, uh, and uh, because of the the very the the pressures of where the sun where the sun was at the time that it was, we started shooting towards the house, which was Barry's side of the the coverage, leaving us uh, trying to leave enough time to turn around on on Ray. Unfortunately, that was when the sandstorm started. And uh, win to the point where... <laughs> Never a thing you want to hear. That was when what? the sandstorm started. <laughs> and and but this was like, a, these were really, this was a challenging scene at the best of times for, for, for an actor. And there she was like, I, I guess I'm going to keep talking, even though my hair is whipping around my face. And I think <laughs> I'm eating sand while I'm, while I'm talking. So we stopped, we had to wait for, I mean, p apart Keeping from everything else, there's, open. there's no continuity. You know, you can't find continuity in the sky behind her. You can't find continuity in the light to cut from side to side. These are very, very challenging. It was, it, so th there were huge long pauses between things. We had to wait for the conditions to pass. And what it really meant was by the time we came around and, and got the all important singles of Ray in the scene, uh, the light just died. It died on us. It's something that you never want to happen. Uh, particularly the sun as, just goes away. Yeah, Eventually, but the, as a, the as day a director, you, you, um, there's a particular kind of pain that goes along with that happening. It compounded by the fact that it was on Ray's side of a very important scene that she was extremely prepared for and ha very thoughtful about and committed to. And, uh, and you always feel as a director that you are not, that you are sort of riding the horse into the wall somehow at that point, even if you can stand from 10,000 feet and go, what could you have done? That the, there was, the light didn't match, there was no still should have started the other way couldn't the sun would have been in the camera still should have should have done it differently it felt horrible we we kept shooting it got dark in the end we ended up shooting takes just for for reference and it wasn't until the shooting of the next episode that we came back and and uh we restaged uh Ray's side of that scene for her medium shots and her close-ups, and uh, and so we'll 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 have to get into the the challenges that that presented for post and for color some other time. But it <laughs> it was it was an extremely challenging process. But I, I'm excited for you to see it, Michael, because it it really is remarkable. I mean, and, and it is a testament to the way that you shot it, and and especially the way that the the talent that Ray has that it 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 is. It is nearly seamless. And by the way, I just to let you in, Ray is dancing around right now in the background. It's, it's, she will be it's, in a future podcast. I, yeah, I, w I wish you all could see it, uh, but it's just for us. And uh, and I'm I'm sad to say that's where we have to leave it. I, this is a we could keep talking. There's so many great scenes. I want to talk even more about to Barry Corbin, about. but oh, but he was legendary rough. Barry Corbin. Uh, I I'm so uh, I I just think he's he's just. 
he's incredible. I mean, and, and what, you, what, who knows what, if we'll have another opportunity to talk about him? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's possible. We yeah. may have another chance to talk about all right, him, excellent. but we just won't know. Um, thank you guys for listening, and thank you all for coming in on, on a Saturday and, and uh, sharing you. your thank thoughts you. and stories. And, uh, you know, Michael, at the end of every episode of this show, we have somebody take us out with their best Bob Odenkirk, Saul Goodman style, Better Call Saul. Would you, would you take us out? <laughs> your voice is, is legendary. I'm the least likely. It, that's to why ever it's be able perfect. to pull that off. That's why it's perfect. Can you give me? Can, can you give me an off-camera um, reading, please? You want a line like, reading? Old, yes. I will definitely give you that. Better call Saul. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Better call Saul. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs>